somewhere beyond the sea there is spark plug coffee if you would buy you would say my oh my i love this stuff yes folks we are shilling our longtime sponsor spark plug coffee who have a great big collection of the freshest beans in canada these are premium arabica beans which are always fairly traded they've got the ones jammed with the caffeine you probably need if you're making a very long quest to find your kidnapped son but they also have decaf and afcaf They've got many blends and roasts, including a rotation of seasonal blends, which will be delivered to Americans and Canadians, of course, within one solid week. We residents of Canada will even get our spark plug on our doorstep without having to pay anything for shipping. You can customize to get your orders when it suits you, but you can and should be a member of the Autopilot Coffee Club. And this is not a Coffee of the Month club, you forgetful blue fish, no. But the membership they do have will get you perks and deals that once in a while types cannot get and being a member will save you some dollars on every single order. So before you go on your dangerous journey across the sea, check out sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S. That H-Y-E-S promo code will give you a one-time savings of 20%. All right, you've heard a few references to Finding Nemo in this sponsorship, so now we need Andrew Luther to cue up his theme music and play us into the podcast proper. And action! Have you ever seen... Finding Nemo. Crikey, dudes! We thank you for cupping your ear to hear Have You Ever Seen's episode number 508. We've been reviewing classic films for over 10 years. Most of that time was when we were known as the Top 100 Project. And we've been spoiling those classic films this whole time. I'm the worrisome clownfish and also your captain in these podcasting enterprises, Nemo Ryan Ellis. Captain Nemo. And here's the forgetful but very funny blue tang... Who usually delights everyone around her. My wife, Marlon Jr., better known as Bev. That's me. She's mine, 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 <laughs> mine, 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 mine. We've had theme months in January, February, March, and April so far this year, but May will just be a random assortment of movies. For instance, next week we're going to be talking about Japanese people. But today it's all about cartoon fish in Australia. Australia! So the coming attractions, trivia. There have been four Toy Story films and two Finding films, so today's Finding Nemo, and of course the sequel Finding Dory. By every measure, all six movies have succeeded, but which of those two franchises has the biggest hit adjusted for inflation, and which has the best reviews on Rotten tomato, Tomatoes? Tomatoes? Tomatoes. I forgot the detail where we're supposed to go adjusted for inflation, but I was thinking today when I was looking at the numbers, it's got to be Finding Nemo. Adjusted for inflation, it came out so long ago, and it came very close to not even adjusting for inflation, beating both Toy Story 3 and Toy Story 4, which are the two top performers. Oh, I didn't see all those details. Or is Finding right. Dory the one? Is it Finding Nemo or well, Finding Well, Finding Dory was a smash. All the Toy Story films But when smashes. you adjust for inflation back in 2003, the amount of money Finding Nemo made, it made like almost a billion dollars. Almost forgetting the adjusted part you're talking about. It's impressive now, but in 2003, game changing. You're right. Finding Nemo made the most money adjusted of the six, and it just missed out on getting the best reviews, too. It is 99% of Rotten Tomatoes, while Toy Story and Toy Story 2 are still at 100%. All six movies did very well in all these categories, though, including Finding Dory, which of the six movies is my least favorite, although it's enjoyable, without a doubt. Okay, You Had Me at Fish was released by Pixar 20 years ago on May 30th, 2003. That's apparently, by the way, what John Laster said after Andrew Stanton went through an elaborate pitch for this movie. <laughs> you Had Me at Fish. <laughs> it cost nearly 100 million bucks to make, but wound up grossing 10 times that amount worldwide. And then there's all that merch and toys and stuff. So that big investment paid off, as it always did with Pixar back in these days of 2003 and so on. It was also the biggest selling DVD of any movie for at least a decade. What I see online says up to 2016, I think is what I saw. So maybe it isn't still, but I bet it's somewhere on the short list. If not, the biggest selling DVD slash Blu-ray and now probably streamed on Disney Plus movie ever. But bet the movie will soon be 20 years old. Please remind people it's about. They know, but tell them anyway. The Skinny on Finding Nemo. Marlin and his son Nemo are clownfish in the ocean, enjoying life in their anemone until Nemo is snatched by a diver who wants him for his fish tank. Though it seems impossible, Marlin is determined to find Nemo, and with the help of the forgetful Dory, along with some sharks, sea turtles, and even a pelican, Marlin gets himself to Sydney Harbor, where Nemo has been on his own adventure, finding a way to get from the fish tank to the ocean, where father and son are finally reunited, braver and wiser than when they started. Or, in a nutshell, 
fishing quips. <laughs> well done, babe. I had an elaborate alliteration type thing there, but I came up with that a few hours before we sat down. Fishing quips. This movie is very funny. Let's not forget that. Because Pixar at their best made beautiful movies. They made meaningful movies. They made you cry. And they almost always made you laugh. We just said it. 99% of critics and Rotten Tomatoes like the film. That's 8.7 out of 10 as an average. There are 269 reviews on the site. 86% of audiences. No surprise it's even that low. Dory, by the way, is very close to that. 94% for the Rotten Tomatoes critics and 84% for the audiences. On the IMDb 250, this is 154th. I ranked it fourth on my own top 10 in 2003. It was number two at the 2003 U.S. box office. Guess what number one was? Was it Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, number one. Also my favorite movie of that year. So I was with the box office people there. Elf, which we've covered, was number seven. And Whale Rider, which we've also covered, was 110th. This film is 60th on Box Office Mojo's Top 200 Adjusted for Inflation, finding Dory is 79th, and there are many animated films that outrank both of them, including Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, 101 Dalmatians. Didn't write them all down, but there are a lot that outrank it. I'm surprised. Well, actually, I'm not that surprised because when a movie becomes a big hit, it's because people go to see it over and over again. Kids' movies especially, that's going to be true about. Finding Nemo won an Oscar, the animated feature. It also was nominated for the original screenplay, the Thomas Newman music score, and the sound editing. This was the third animated Oscar winner, so the award was that new. Shrek won the first one, we covered that. And Spirited Away won the second one, and we covered that too. Finding Nemo was 10th in the animation category in the AFI's Top 100 Genres list, and it was nominated for the AFI's 2007 Top 100 list, so we could have covered it many years ago when we were still doing the AFI movies. I wouldn't have put this on there, but I'm glad it got recognized with a nomination. What do you think about a movie I know you've seen before, but it's probably been a long time, Finding Nemo? It's funny, it has a great story, great characters, breathtaking to look at even 20 years later. They created such an outstanding world to inhabit. That said, it's not my favorite. I find it a little more cloying than most Pixar films. I find the relationship between Marlon and Nemo off-putting. That's probably something I should talk about with my shrink. I really don't think it's the movie's fault. But for whatever reason, I respect Finding Nemo more than I like it. Because I'm allergic to kids' movies. Anyone who listens to this podcast knows that about me by now. Except for Up. Up is an exception for me. There's the uh, Spirited Away. I absolutely adore. Spirited Away definitely bucks that cutesy and cloying. That's the word for me. Just something that's just too gentle, so predictable. Of course kids love it. And of course it's great. I mean, adults love it too. But it really rubs me the wrong way. What about Albert Brooks? Because I know you love him in Lost in America. But I wouldn't say you're generally his biggest fan. And he is probably great casting for this, but they make him on purpose, and maybe because they cast him in this role, after apparently William H. Macy had done a lot of the dialogue. He had just about finished recording it, and then they fired him. And also a good choice for the role, I, know. I would think. But they get Brooks in there doing the Brooks thing. And of course, he's a funny guy, but then he's the straight man yeah, for yeah. most of the movie, too, especially Ellen DeGeneres, who's so, so great. Nemo. Yeah, the two of them are the... The clownfish are not the funny ones. Yeah, so true. Everyone else gets to be funny. Yeah, everybody else gets to be this really but great, outrageous character. But is Brooks part of the problem, is my question to you. I love Albert Brooks, but I find Marlon the most annoying character in the movie. Well, Nemo's pretty annoying, maybe because he's voiced by an actual kid. They're, in my opinion, the most unlikable characters in the movie, so it's hard to sympathize with their plight. What about Dory? Oh, oh, Dory. She's hysterically funny. I liked Finding Dory, but I don't like her as much as the main characters. Here it is right now. Wait, wait, Screenplay. Wait. You like Dory, but didn't like her as much as she's I'm sorry, I like character. Finding Dory, the movie. Okay. But I feel like it doesn't work as well when she's a main character, because the I main character that, yeah. has to be kind of serious. The side characters get to have all the fun, and they get to be the most beloved and goofy and hilarious. Dory in this movie is so funny, and she is the light of the movie. Every time she's not on screen, you wonder where she is, and you want her to come back, and you care as much about her plight as you do about Nemo and Marlin, because she's on her own journey. She has her own growth that she goes through through the course of the film. We find out why in the sequel. The best thing about Finding Dory is that it's really funny. It's like a rule of storytelling that your main character can only be so... Funny, unless it's Elf and which I love you, he's man. The yes, thing. Elf and I love you, man are two exceptions to that rule because Rod is hilarious and I love you, man. Probably the funniest thing in the movie, and probably Farrell is the funniest thing in yeah. Elf. Either you have a character like Elf, where every single other person in the movie is the straight man and he is the goofy one, true, or you have a movie like Funny Nemo, where you have these two straight man characters and everybody else is goofy and fun and outrageous. Part of the problem with this, I think, is that Marlon, and this is the way it's written, it's not Brooks's fault, gives up so easily. He has fun. 
once, maybe twice in the whole movie, and it's when they're bouncing on jellyfish, the most dangerous thing they go through in the whole movie, other than, I guess, being chased by the shark. But when they're going through that whole jellyfish school, school of jellyfish, Good question. he makes that fun for once. He gets through, he thinks everything's fine. Yeah, it was great. Let's go again. Oh, no. Dory got stung. Now I got to save Dory. So that's a serious moment, and it needs to be when she's hurt. But he also gives up so easily. I don't really blame him. It's an incredible journey they go on. This movie could have been called The Incredible Journey, as much as it was Finding Nemo. They're lucky they managed to make any of this work. Of course, they get in the EAC, the East Australian Current, I believe it's called, EAC. And Andrew Stanton, the director of this movie and co-writer, and one of the important people at Pixar for many years, is the voice of Crush, of course, too. I think I also read that he's the voice of mine, 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 mine. <laughs> One of the best contributions this movie made to culture is the seagulls. Mm -hmm. And that's a long list of great things they contributed to culture. But even when Marlon is in a moment where there's nothing you can do, you're just on the current, let it take you where it's going to go, have a little bit of fun. He lightens up a little bit, but that's the character they wrote. And even then, he's being a bit of a prig. You have to do that to keep the tension in the movie. There yeah. are pretty high stakes, and you've created a character who, if he loses Nemo and he doesn't find him again... He's ruined. He'll never recover from that. Fish suicide. He never recovered from losing Coral, his wife, his partner, his mate, and all the other eggs that they lost in the Barracuda attack. He's so fragile to begin with. Of course, the course of the journey teaches him to toughen up and lighten up and trust his son, of course, to take chances. He can chances. do it. So he can do it. Nemo goes on his own journey, realizing that maybe he should have trusted his father and he needs his father as much as his father needs him, too. Mm -hmm. What about the look of the film? Because it is one of the best-looking movies that they made at that point, and maybe still is now. Apparently, the animators made the water look too good at first, so they had to change that because people would have just said, you just shot water. You had underwater cameras, and you went down, and you just shot it, and then you put your animated movie. That's not what they did, but that's how good these guys had gotten in eight years of computer animation, because Toy Story was 1995. But also, the scary scenes. You just said the Barracuda attack, and I mentioned the shark chase. When you go on Finding Nemo's IMDb page, it shows a close-up of Bruce. I'm not saying it's a scary image, but to a little kid who might be, or somebody who has a fear of sharks, who happens to go on the Finding Nemo webpage, it might freak them out a little bit because it's a close-up of a great white, which doesn't look just like a great white, but it's close. We're sitting beside my Jaws homage. It took me a little while to get used to the Jaws picture, and whenever I flip past in one of the Jaws movies, even when the bad ones is on, it could make my skin crawl a little bit because that's the point. It's a scary animal. But anyway, so the movie looks incredible, but also has some scenes that, for Pixar, some of the scariest stuff they'd ever shot with the Barracuda attack and the shark chase. So in 2003, they'd made A Bug's Life, Toy Story. Toy Story Mon 2. Monsters, Inc. And Monsters, Inc. But you're right. In those movies, I can't think of a situation. There's peril. When you watch Toy Story, there's serious peril. The stakes are high in a lot of those action sequences. Mm. They're hanging off the back of a truck. You can't tell me that's not scary, but not scary in the visceral lizard brain way that a shark in your face is scary. Or a barracuda. Or a barracuda, yeah. Because they look fairly accurate. Or an the... anglerfish. That's my favorite. Right. Pretty funny the anglerfish is the one that when they go into the deep and you can't see anything and there's the little light in front of it and then they discover that it's this big ugly fish. It's mm. a real fish. And a funny sequence too because mm -hmm. Dory's reading, very slowly reading... <laughs> The mask to figure out where they are. P. Sherman, something Wallaby Way, Sydney. Well, DeGeneres is definitely the star of this movie, and though she's second build, she steals it. She's one of the best supporting characters or co leads, whatever you want to call it. Definitely one of the best female characters in Pixar's history, one of the best animated characters of all time. She was good in the sequel, too, but as you said, has to be the star of the movie. Not an obvious choice, though, because of the whole controversy about her daring to say, I like girls, and I am a girl. So she comes out, loses her TV show. What was that show just called? The Ellen DeGeneres Show, maybe? Oh my gosh, I can't remember. Or was it actually some actual name, like Mad About You or something? No, it was Ellen. Her name was in the show. Okay. Anyway, she comes out, and people would deny that, I'm sure, at the network, but that's why she lost her show, because she dared to say who she likes to be with. And she actually did get, maybe not blacklisted, but graylisted for a while. Yeah. We didn't really see her much. This was the comeback. She was, yeah, yeah. This is that's why she right, got the show. Is. And I know that she's terrible because she treats her employees badly and I'm going to hate her forever. But until we find <laughs> out about that thing, I'm just getting a little tired of people judging all these things. People for out. being toxic at work. It's not cool that that's what it was. It's probably more her VPs and executives and things that were doing that, but maybe because they knew the way she wanted to be. I've heard Denzel Washington. You can't make eye contact with him on set. And that's part of the thing with Ellen I heard, too, with the talk show. Well, nobody's saying Denzel Washington's terrible and toxic, so I'm not trying to forgive Ellen. It's just one of those things that it's not my... I'm just going to swear. Not my work environment. So 
if she was a big phony all that time about being Mrs. Nice Girl, she really sold it well on that TV show. I saw it here and there. I like her stand-up comedy. I've seen a couple of her specials. And this is an outstanding voice performance. So I'm not trying to say that those other things don't matter. But people are just so quick to judge about something that has nothing to do with them whatsoever. If she hurt somebody at work, as in punched them or got them fired, that would be a different story. It's because her entire persona is wrapped up in being this likable lady. Mm. Everybody has had a toxic bullying boss. Everybody knows that sick feeling of having to go to work every day and what may have started out as your dream job. I think that's happened to a lot of people. You think, oh my God, I finally made it. I got this gig on the Ellen DeGeneres show. I'm living in New York and I'm doing this amazing gig. And then it turns into a nightmare. So I think those two things, the relatability of it and her persona, Denzel Washington is A, always playing a character, B, always pretty serious guys. And she's pretty much always played likable and nice. Her show would be nothing if she wasn't likable. James Corden is getting a lot of grief now about the stories right. coming out about... For the same uh, reason. The stories about him are quite a bit worse than anything I ever heard about Ellen DeGeneres. But part of it's the hypocrisy. And now he's leaving his show. It's the hypocrisy of having a persona of this really nice person. Now, do I find her the biggest villain in Hollywood? Far from it. I really don't think about it. I've never really watched her show. Does it spoil her for me a little bit? A person that, whether I watched her show or not, I always, in the background, liked her and wished her well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does affect my opinion of her, but that's Hollywood. That's the break. So what about her in this movie, then? You agree with me that she's outstanding? She's wonderful. It doesn't spoil this movie for me at all. Maybe partially because we don't see her face. And also because her big scare quotes, crimes, are not actual crimes. They're gossip more than anything else. Okay, so one of the characters in this that when I first saw this, and maybe even the second time I saw it, because that probably would have been a couple years later, I must have bought the DVD. We own the DVD, even though we watched Disney Plus to see the film. I'm sure the Disney Plus print is better than the DVD is. I thought we had the Blu-ray, but we don't. Anyway, the first time I saw this, I thought Willem Dafoe was going to end up being a villain. Not just because it's Willem Dafoe, but because of the way he talks to Nemo. Now, the movie, by the way, is pretty well balanced between Marlon and Dory out in the ocean and Nemo and everybody in the fish tank. Once Nemo gets to the fish tank, it's pretty balanced. But I just thought for the longest time that Gil was going to turn out to be a bad guy and he was setting up Nemo. So I don't know if I enjoyed those sequences as much as I have since because I kept on expecting him. He was never going to kill the fish. Let's face it. Nemo is going to be found. You don't have an animated kids movie called Finding Nemo and not have him be found. And <laughs> Almost saved. Finding Nemo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got close. But although apparently the whole thing about him going through the drain to get out to the ocean is not at all true because yeah, they of, don't put sewage. It should be called raw sewage. It should be called grinding Nemo is what I was reading online. <laughs> Because when you put something down the drain, it doesn't just go out the way you think it does, whether it be a dead fish. And that's another thing, too. People bought all kinds of beautiful fish, clownfish and tangs and so on after this. Oh, no. But much like the pandemic with dogs, they didn't really want to actually have these Salt animals. Saltwater fish. So they got flushed. They're found in the ocean. They're very hard to look after. There's a reason everybody just has goldfish. Freshwater fish are so much easier. That's a good point that this movie would have absolutely encouraged people but to Gil is a hero in the end. Pets. Gil is a hero in the end, is what I'm saying, though. Did you get that same impression the first time you saw this? I'm guessing you didn't this time. But did you feel well, like, oh, maybe he actually is setting him up? Because so many movies we've seen that where somebody's on their side. Look at Lotso in Toy Story 3. Oh, yeah. One of the best villains. There are some real villains in Pixar movies. But there's lots of Pixar movies with no real villain. Toy Story 1 has no villain. Well, Sid. Sid, sort of. But Sid is inadvertently doing his thing. He doesn't have actual malicious intent. He eventually becomes a garbage man who saves toys he wears his shirt with the skull on yeah, it. yeah so it's clearly him yeah. yeah and you'll see him growing up in other movies but he's learned his lesson i can't remember what the good deed is that he does but well he... people point out too that even in the very first movie that all he's really doing is just experimenting with his toys he's not just doing exactly what the manufacturer says to do with your toys and he isn't doing anything that isn't what the little girl does in toy story 4 when she creates forky it's just an act of creativity yeah. right making your own toy there's Gotta be lots of toys that Except are made by kids. He does explode them and he wants to exploit Woody. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Explode Woody? Yeah. <laughs> he wants to blow him up. And the villain in Finding Nemo is what? The dentist? Somebody who had the best intentions. He wants to get a gift for his niece. <laughs> <laughs> Who's gonna kill this <laughs> Who's fish? Who's gonna kill this fish? Okay, fine. But has no idea he's doing anything wrong takes great care of his fish and actually says when he's dropping Nemo in the tank, he was going to be eaten by a piranha or whatever. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what he says, but he's like, oh, I saved him from certain death and now he's going to live the life of luxury in my fish tank for the rest of his days. A clownfish off in the middle of the ocean like that, 
away from the Great Barrier Reef is probably pretty susceptible. And that's a good scene too, because it's one of the last times, it is the last time that Marlin sees him for days. I don't know how long the journey is supposed to have lasted, but it must be quite a while, the Marlin and Dory going to try to find Nemo. But when it's, don't you put one fit on that boat? And of course the slap sound, good sound effect, sound effects editing Oscar nomination, this deserved it. But when he does touch the boat and then starts to swim back, that's when the dude comes out of nowhere, P. Sherman, I guess it's him that comes up and captures him because he's looking for samples and fish probably anyway. And yes, this fish is out where it doesn't really belong. And also just a dumb bit of luck is that they happen to knock off the mask because if they didn't do that, Marlon was never going to find Nemo. The other thing that really benefits Nemo and Marlon this whole journey too is the game of telephone. Marlon tells a story to one fish that goes through animal to animal to animal, gets eventually to Nigel, the pelican, and he's the one that tells all the fish in the tank, including Nemo, who had given up. But then when he hears, my dad is coming, he's re-energized and he manages to block that fan with the pebble. That's another reason why I thought maybe Gil was a villain, because I thought, okay, yeah, he is trying to get out of this fish tank and he's explaining why, but he's risking this kid's life and is it almost like he's jealous about this? I just maybe misinterpreted this entirely, but I really thought that maybe he was not a hero in the end. And Gil is at least a good guy, if not a hero. Well, he is zero because he yeah. helps Nemo get out of there. Yeah, he helps them all get out Sacrifices of there. himself to do it, too. Because he yeah. flops out onto the dentist, whatever that thing is, the spit thing. Yeah. And, of course, luckily enough, the dentist puts him back in the tank. By the way, you mentioned Nigel the Pelican. Jeffrey Rush does the voice of Nigel in his actual accent because he's Australian. Right. And The show must go on. <laughs> <laughs> it bugs me since the first time I saw this movie how easy it would be for Nigel to just take all the fish from the tank, put them in his beak, and carry them to the ocean, and 30 seconds later, they're all free. It's kind of like in Lord of the Rings, where everyone's like, couldn't you have just flown the birds the whole way? Just mm -hmm. top on their back? There are a few answers to that with Lord of the Rings, but with this movie specifically, maybe that would work, except that when Nigel does even go to the window, let alone get inside the dentist's office at all, the dentist swats him away. He does that more than once. Okay, but do you think that it's less likely that he could get the fish or that the fish could have gotten themselves into bags and rolled across the highway and dropped into the ocean from there? And it does lead to a great payoff. <laughs> I thought it was at the very end of the movie as an, an outtake we see now, but they didn't really do that so much back in 2003. But it's before the, well, maybe the credits have rolled for a few seconds, but it's really early on in the end credits where you just see them all, Gil and the guys, of course Nemo's long gone. The men and women fish are in the bags, now what? <laughs> Cut to black, go back to the credits again. That was a good touch. But good point, yes. I guess Nigel could have probably saved them. And we see him do the same thing with Marlon and Dory because he scoops them up in his mouth with water to take them to the fish tank in the first place, to the dentist's office in the first place. Yeah. So we talked about the scariness of the Barracuda scene, and that is when Coral does die along with most of the progeny, Marlon Jr. and Coral Jr. And Coral, by the way, is the voice of Elizabeth Perkins, and, of course, we've covered her before because we did Big quite a long time ago. She and Brooks would have been pretty good, I think, in a movie together on screen rather than just voices. They seemed like a pretty good team early on in this. But about the shark thing, of course, most of that's played for comedy. We've never covered Eric Bana before, but now we have because he's one of the fish. Also doing his real accent. He's Australian yeah, he as well. Yeah, he can be Australian. Whenever I hear him now because of a movie he promoted a couple of years ago on Mark Maron's podcast, The Dry. So the dry, but of course the dry, yes, the Every dry, time you the see the dry, anywhere you have to say the dry. I just recently saw the movie too, and it's a solid film. It's a decent thriller. But yeah, he's one of the fish along with Bruce Spence, who's I think in that movie too, in the dry. <laughs> but he is the gyrocopter helicopter operator, whatever you call it. The gyrocopter, I believe it's called, in The Road Warrior, the second Mad Max movie. He's in Lord of the Rings also. I think he's in Return of the King. He's the voice at the end that comes out with this weird mm. mouth and then Aragorn cuts his head off or something. He had a good year. He's been acting for a yeah, big year there. He's been acting for a long time, though. But Barry Humphreys is Bruce. That's a reference, of course, to Jaws, because Spielberg named the mechanical shark Bruce after his lawyer. But anyway, so that scene where they're talking about how fish are friends, except dolphins, <laughs> because they are one of the few natural enemies of sharks, because dolphins can and have, apparently. I don't know how they have footage of this or how they know this, but I guess some divers and fishermen must have seen this at some point. Maybe they had cameras underwater. But dolphins will right into the shark's guts and explode them, is what I've heard. Or killer whales do that as well, maybe? Whales and dolphins also will fight. Fish will come after them for one reason or another. It's kind of a phenomenon they've only really witnessed recently, and they still don't understand why it happens. Mm -hmm. They're very intelligent creatures, so their motives could be pretty sophisticated. Dolphins. For all we know. Dolphins and orcas. But that sequence is pretty funny, too, when they're doing the... Alcoholics Anonymous, basically, meeting. And <laughs> like, then do the end, they eat if they don't eat fish? Right, they gotta eat something. At the end of the movie, of course, Dory's part of their team. 
they drop her off at the very end when Nemo's going to school and everything's fine now. So the sequence is pretty funny, but then as I say, it gets to be pretty intimidating and scary looking because at one point I think Bruce is ramming its snout into something or other. Of course, a shark wouldn't do that because it would knock itself out, basically. I've seen this on Shark Week. I haven't watched Shark Week in a long time, but if you just touch a shark's, or I guess it's a great white especially, snout, it's like it goes, uh, 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 drug, I don't know what to do. That's a real thing. I thought it was an urban legend. I know I've seen this. That's the whole thing they say. If you're ever in a shark's mouth, I guess a great white specifically, go for the eyes and at the very least hit the snout. Really? And maybe that's not true, but I have seen on Shark Week a guy, and it wasn't the giant one that was jumping on the boat in the movie, as much as I love Jaws. That is ridiculous. But it was a great white that was trying to feed. It came up out of the water a little bit. The guy just went, oh, push you back. And it was almost like it was, oh, I can't, oh, I'm hypnotized. Huh. I used to wonder why they would dedicate an entire week to sharks until I met you. <laughs> and then I finally met someone who loved sharks enough. You observe Shark Week. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I think I saw it enough times. I felt like I don't want to keep on watching this every year. I probably should get back to it this summer because I haven't watched it in maybe a decade by now. Well, there's probably new information now. Probably. I bet every year it gets pretty repetitive. Maybe I'm wrong about what I've just said then. They're always making new discoveries. So what did you think of the sequence then when the sharks find Marlin and Dory? But then Dory gets a little bit of blood. This is the rare blood in any kids movie, especially an animated movie. But it's because the sharks have to, well, especially Bruce, have to smell the blood in the water so he'll go nuts because he needs to eat. The sequence is great. I'm never one for action sequences. They never really sell a movie for me. And it makes it hard for me to buy that anybody would forgive them later in the film, not just because they turn on them, but because they're super predators and there's three of them and it's a miracle that they got away. So the idea that Dory, I mean, Dory doesn't remember. So of course she's like, these are my friends. Mm -hmm. This is great. But then you think Marlon would be like, get away from them because he's so nervous all the time. Yeah, now they're right with all these kids and his own kid, but all these other ones too, when they're going up to school on Mr. Ray. I guess the opposite of that sequence when they get chased because it is a little bit scary for a little bit there, especially for little kids, I guess, is when Marlon and Dory end up with the turtles on the EAC. That's entirely fun. As much as you're not a fan of kids, and I'm not really either, I do love the kid that does the voice of Squirt. Squirt, right. Crush and Squirt. They name them after the two popular citrus-flavored sodas. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so Stanton's a lot of fun as Crush. Whoa, righteous, righteous! <laughs> but then Squirt giving the instructions... We're going to have a good whatever swim today. I thought that was pretty cute, too. Did you like that? No, I was annoyed by the kid voice. Oh, because I, I, have a, I have a dead black heart. I am wrong. It's okay. I can be wrong. I remember the first time I've seen the movie Finding Crush incredibly charming. I always love the joke. What is it? Mr. Turtle's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find out he's 150 years yeah. old. Turtles don't actually live to be that old. I was reading too, but whatever. But that's tortoises a big thing. Tortoises do. It's not turtles. Land tortoises are the ones that turtles live a long time too, but not mm. 150 years away tortoises. That's probably a mistake by the Nemo filmmakers, but it also could be a matter of he doesn't know what he's talking about, meaning Crush doesn't know what he's talking about, and they did that on purpose. Oh. He's not exactly okay. brilliant. <laughs> that's very forgiving of you. They worked pretty hard to be scientifically accurate. Like the idea that clownfish can survive a jellyfish sting because... They live in anemones, which are poisonous and sting mm. all the time, but they've evolved to become immune to stings. That's right. a nice little scientific detail that is true. But Dory does get stung. She does have the mask around her face, or is around her fin, actually. It's around her fin for a long time, which is a little bit ridiculous, but I'll let that slide because they need the mask. It is the most important part I didn't part say of it was film. a totally scientific accurate yes. film. For instance, tang fish cannot read. <laughs> <laughs> They're illiterate. Can they talk to whales? <laughs> can they speak whales? Hello. Oh, she can. I love that she's right. She can talk to whales. The sequence when the blue whale comes out from behind them, that looked like something you'd actually see in the real ocean. So I can see why people thought some parts of this movie were just them taking a camera down in the ocean and shooting something down there. They worked really hard to get accuracy. Everybody who worked on the film, all the animators, had to go scuba diving. They had to learn how to scuba dive, and they had to spend time down there studying the fish and studying oceanography in general. And they developed new technologies to create that underwater world, including a technique to blur things that are in the distance, which really works in that whale sequence mm -hmm. where he comes into focus. It's not like he's coming out of the shadows. It's just more like the way you see underwater, that yeah. things just don't come into focus until they're closer to you. And I think that's not quite scientifically accurate also is that they do go out as blowhole. I guess the stomach is not connected or the mouth is not connected to the blowhole. No, it's true. Another scientific but problem. another fun thing where dory thinks the whale's telling her go to the back of the throat and then you'll go at the blowhole which is true in this movie's case at least 
She can talk to whales. DeGeneres also gets a moment where she gets to be emotional. And apparently people in the filming session when they were doing that recording session, not filming, but recording from the audio, got emotional too because Ellen was so legitimate. Doesn't want to be off on her own. Doesn't know why she's on her own in the first place. And we'll probably forget all about Marlon and Dory anyway. I love that she's also calling Nemo something else. She goes through all the Marx Brothers names. (laughs) Chico and (laughs) Zeppo. And And then the best joke at the end when she's gone through so much growth throughout the film and she just happens to come across Nemo. She goes, wait, what did you say your name was? Nemo. What a great name. (laughs) She just carries on. It's such a great misdirect. It's so funny. Speaking of her performance again, we covered Promising Young Woman last week, which is a movie that is mostly drama, although it has jokes, but it casts a lot of comedic actors in roles that have to have very serious moments. Molly Shannon, she's not funny once in that movie. She Mm -hmm. has one incredible scene that's very emotional and pure and grounded. She's not a superstar. She's not a superstar in that movie. The point I'm trying to make here is comedy is the hardest thing you can do. So over and over, we discover that comedic actors are actually the best actors, whether they're doing drama or comedy, and can pull off drama in surprising ways and really tug on your heartstrings, really give these incredible performances. So it doesn't surprise me at all that Ellen DeGeneres, who can be this funny and this natural and who always understands the assignment and gets it perfect, can also draw on those places to really emotionally connect with an audience, so much so that she's connecting with the techs who are in the room with her when she's recording. Well, look what she'd gone through with her life. She comes out and she pays the price for it. It's bad enough anyone does that to you at all, but you don't get to have a career anymore. And who knows what it was even like before that, because she was in the closet for so long, which is its own kind of trauma. And She had to pretend to like Bill Pullman and Mr. Wright. (laughs) That is torture. (laughs) He was handsome. Wasn't there a romance with her and McConaughey? In, in a Ed movie? TV? Oh, it could be. She's funny in that movie. I didn't like Ed TV very much. It's way inferior to Truman Show. No, no. Set the same year. Jenna Elfman is the romantic. That's what it is. That's yeah. what I am. But Ellen is in that, and she's definitely one of the funniest things in it, even though McConaughey and Woody teamed up, I think, for the first time in that. But she steals that movie. And she's barely made a movie, by the way, since this time frame. She made this. She made Finding Dory. And almost everything else in her resume is playing herself and things. And, of course, her TV show. The talk yeah. show, which I guess is over now. And the talk show... That's a full-time job and a half. It's incredible that Jay Leno would tour and perform on the weekends when he was doing The Late Show. I think the same nights often he would Yeah, do the yeah, show. exactly. That's wild. He'd go to Vegas. Yeah, and virtually everyone else who does that kind of job is like, you have no idea. This job is so hard. And he's so not 33. consuming yeah. Leno got the gig when he was probably in his 40s or 50s. Yeah. Back in the early 90s. Speaking of jokes, there continue to be jokes when we get the thing where the two clownfish have to team up to save Dory when she's in the big net. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Now becomes Marlin's credo to get them to tip the boat over until it breaks. You feel a little bad for the fishermen. We can say, well, there are villains. They're killing these animals. Yeah, have you ever eaten a fish? Then shut up. (laughs) Take that. (laughs) But anyway, in that sequence, we do find out that finally Marlin believes in Nemo. Because Nemo has the idea of swimming down because he'd seen that in the fish tank with Gale and everybody else. In order for him to prove himself, he has to go to the most dangerous place imaginable. Mm -hmm. And a mirror of the place where he got abducted in the first place because he was captured by a net by the diver Mm -hmm. or the dentist, as we learn later. Yeah. So there's a lot of people in this cast. Albert Brooks, of course, was in Taxi Driver in a mostly serious role. Lost in America, which we both love so much. I won't quote your favorite line because we're going to go G-rated in this one, but... (laughs) And I eat something? Yeah. <laughs> and burn rubber to New York. Oh, the funniest ending to a Brad! movie ever. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funniest things he's ever said is that simple pronunciation of that guy's name. <laughs> Brad! <laughs> I was kidding! <laughs> Broadcast News, of course, he's in that too, where he's both funny and caustic. He's in Out of Sight, where he's mostly caustic, but a little bit funny. And now here we cover him in our, I guess, fifth movie that he's been in, in one way or another. This is our first Ellen DeGeneres movie. I know we promoted, I'm almost certain we promoted, we're going to do Finding Dory as a Now Playing Project podcast back in 2016 because we had vacation time and we saw the movie but then didn't record a podcast. We did one for The Shallows in our backyard and thought we'll do another fish movie. A whole different thing than The Shallows but didn't end up doing it after all. Alexander Gould is the voice of Nemo. He did a lot of TV and voiceover work in general. He was on Weeds, I guess. I don't know who he was. We watched the show. Maybe he's the main character's kid. I don't know. Willem Dafoe. This makes nine movies we've covered him in now. Platoon, The Last Temptation of Christ, Wild at Heart, American Psycho, Spider-Man 2, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Florida Project, and The Lighthouse. I'm not sure who the most we've ever covered a person is, but that's way up there. 
nine films, and most of those are pretty major roles. Yeah, he's got a cameo in Spider-Man 2, but most of those are pretty important roles. And some villain roles, some hero roles. He plays Jesus. He also plays a real bad guy in Wild at Heart. Jeffrey Rush already quoted it before, but he wasn't Shakespeare in Love. The show must go on. He's great in that. He was nominated for that. Allison Janney's one of the fish in the tank. We've covered her, I think, only once before in Hairspray. She's Tracy's best friend's mother in that film. Not a great role for her, but then Chris and I did cover her in the Oscar-winning performance, I, Tonya, because that, of course, is a sports movie, and that is on, scoring at the movies. It was originally Megan Mullally playing the part of the starfish. At the time, she was only really famous for being in Will and Grace. And they didn't realize that was a put-on voice when she's portraying Karen. So she starts off doing a different voice or her own voice to play the starfish. They were like, no, 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 do your Karen voice. And she flat out refused and quit instead of compromising, instead of agreeing to do Karen. She's been funny on Bob's Burgers, though, as the voice of Linda's sister. Legendary in Parks and Rec. Every time she's on Parks and Rec, it's one of their best episodes. These are shows that are not new anymore, but yeah. Stephen Root is in this too. He's one of the other fish. Of course, he was in all the Cohen, not all, but a few of the Cohen movies like No Country for Old Men, but also Funny and No Brother Where Art Thou. Vicki Lewis, who I don't really know very well, but she was in News Radio. Brad Garrett, the deep voice guy. I believe he's the one that has the now what line at the very end when they're all in the water, but still in their bags. Of course, Everybody Loves Raymond is his most famous thing. And Austin Pendleton, who was in the Muppet movie, and I think he got cast because of that. He is Doc Hopper's assistant until he turns on Doc Hopper because he doesn't like what they're trying to do to Kermit. So pretty good voice cast. Not surprisingly with Pixar, though. They almost always cast great people in the smaller roles in addition to the main characters. They really haven't ever failed, I wouldn't say, too often anyway. The biggest failure that Pixar has ever had as far as casting, wasn't even casting, actually, was the writing. But having Larry the Cable Guy be a main character in Cars 2, and then they almost made the same mistake, you could argue, going into it. How is Finding Dory going to work when she's so great in the supporting role? Not that Larry the Cable Guy was awesome in Cars 2, or the first Cars, I mean. But then you cast him as the main character in Cars 2, and it's just too much of him. Did the movie fail? Cars 2, probably not financially. No, it didn't fail financially, and they still made a Cars 3. So it failed in your mind that you think it's a bad movie. I think it's kind of universally considered a lesser Pixar film. Partly because of the way they wrote it, and that could have been the same problem with Finding Dory, but it wasn't. It's just not as good as Finding Nemo. Andrew Stanton, who wrote and directed this, he won an Oscar for it, also for WALL-E. He's got four writing nominations in total in his career, so a lot of the movies he's worked on have been at the big show. His co-director, Lee Unkrich, went on to win Oscars for Toy Story 3 and Coco, a movie I keep saying i got to see again. I still haven't. I will one of these days. Stanton, Bob Peterson, and David Reynolds got writing credits on this. I'm sure it was probably 12 other people, if not more, because that's the way it works with animation, especially at Pixar. They're very collaborative. Bob Peterson is the voice of Doug in Up. Squirrel! <laughs> and he's the Ray in this. And David Reynolds has been working for Disney for a very long time. Graham Walters was a producer. He was mentioned by Stanton in his acceptance speech at the Oscars. He's worked on a lot of Pixar films. And John Lasseter, he doesn't work there anymore because he's a grabby guy, was, of course, an executive producer. Whenever they won Oscars, he was always referenced and credited. Because at least with the guys, he was great to work with, from what I understand, but not so much if you were a girl, or a woman, I should say. Pixar is legendary, but there's some pretty fair criticism about how it may be a dream place to work if you're a very specific kind of person, but... Not if you're a different kind of person. And it was when Rashida Jones got hired to write uh, on no, no, out. Toy Story 4. Oh, okay. I think it was Toy Story 4. I read that she was hired to write. Oh, that's right. She walked out. And she was pretty vague about why she walked out. And she's never taken ownership about getting Lassiter outed. But it kind of got the ball rolling because then some people started talking. And they managed to keep it relatively quiet. But it sounds like he was a pretty prolific sexual harasser. She's a voice in Inside Out. That's what I was thinking of, by the way. Ah, okay, which makes sense because Amy Poehler and her are real tight. So the movie's 185 to 1. We saw it on Disney+, Plus, although we own the DVD. This is a fairly new thing at this point, I think, 20 years ago, where they started having a cinematographer credit. I thought it was even more recent than this. They actually called it that because animated films never had cinematography credits before. But Sharon Callahan gets it on this, along with Jeremy Lasky. She worked on Toy Story 2, and he worked on just many Pixar's in general. The editor, David Ian Salter... Worked on Toy Story 2, but had been an assistant editor on A Bug's Life. And the composer, who was nominated for an Oscar, has had 15 nominations, has still never won. I think it's Randy Newman's cousin, Thomas Newman. I think they're both related to Alfred Newman, the guy who did the Fox fanfare a long time ago and was nominated for a bunch of Oscars of his own. They're definitely related. I think you're right. I think they're cousins. Because Randy Newman worked with Pixar over and over again, and here's now Thomas. Isn't this the first Pixar film that wasn't scored by Randy Newman? And probably one of the few as well, because I think Newman came back for, Randy came back for other ones too. 
But Thomas worked on Shawshank Redemption and, of course, American Beauty a couple years before this and many others, but has had 15 nominations in his career. Two of my favorite scores. So I went down a bit of a rabbit hole looking into Pixar because Pixar is such a phenomenon. It's just so admirable how consistent the quality of their work is. So I looked into the way they work, or at least the way they worked. I'm not sure how things have changed since they were bought by Disney, since Lasseter was let go. I think it's safe to say that most people have acknowledged that while they're still making quality films, they're no longer in their golden age. But during Pixar's golden age, probably the most striking thing about the way they worked was two things. One, like you said before, incredibly collaborative, huge teams with lots of diffused creative control instead of this top-down system of micromanaging exec whose main role is truly financing. Instead, they give people real creative control, which makes them more creative and more committed to the project, but also a huge draw for hiring talent. But the other, and in my opinion, far more striking thing that Pixar did that was different is they have this astounding commitment to putting quality first to the point that many of the films they've made have been made more than once. They had no problem with scrapping something that wasn't working and just going back to the drawing board, even when it meant tons of people's work was going down the drain. And they would rewrite and rewrite and rewrite until they were satisfied and still... If that rewrite, once they saw it on screen, fully animated, representing thousands of hours of work, if it still wasn't working, they would willingly just throw it away and start again. You can only do it with animation because you can't do it if somebody's shooting. (laughs) There's just limitations when you're shooting live action. It's a lot easier to go back to the drawing board with animation than it is to go back to the drawing board when you have actors and costumes and locations and everything that comes with shooting live. What you get on the day is what you get on the day. So they have this flexibility that allows them to go back and forth like this. People study Pixar screenplays. They're famously flawless. They truly are just... the old ones. The old ones, okay, but I'm talking about the golden age of Pixar, you know? I'm not talking about movies that are still good, like Onward or, well, you didn't like Turning Red. The last 10 years, there have been some great ones, beautiful ones. We love Soul, Inside Out. Inside Out is certainly one of my favorites. Up is before the period we're talking about now. That's still the golden age, but Inside Out for sure. Toy Story 4 is not nearly as good as the other three, but it's still really good, especially technically. Wow. Soul is very good too, but there's a lot of, by their standards, duds was their first failure. The good dinosaur really yeah. failed, right? I saw Brave again a couple years ago. I thought, I still don't think this is very good. It's all right. I'm glad you finally had a girl star, but it isn't very good. Cars 2 wasn't very good. Cars 3 was okay at best. I didn't like Turning Red very much. I like the concept of having a girl star and the other star is a woman. It's Asian people. It's set in Toronto. That's fun, but I don't think it's a very good movie. You can love it all you want to. I didn't like it. I think they've had a weak last decade or so. But yes, they were Babe Ruth and Wayne Gretzky and Muhammad Ali and Michael Jordan over and over again from 95 until at least 2010 with Toy Story 3, the first Toy Story, to the third one. I think Brave actually was after that, so really and truly, I would say fell off a cliff because there have been some really good stuff in there, including Finding Dory. It's fine. It's good. But Inside Out is the only really truly great film they've made since, I would say, Toy Story 3, unless I'm missing something else in there. I would say they're incomparable. No other studio has accomplished that level of quality, that level of influence, and that much financial success, too, because it's beyond, oh, they did something incredible, they made all these great movies, even though they spend all this time, which means money, Mm -hmm. on these films. I did say this cost $100 million to make. $100 million for an animated film. 20 years ago. Exactly. That was a lot of money. But it made almost a billion Mm dollars, proving that this style of working can be successful, it can make a lot of money. I wouldn't say it's unprecedented, only because I think early Disney, and maybe Disney again in the 90s, even Disney in the 90s in their second golden age. They had some duds. That's like what? Four or five movies we're talking about before the quality right, started right to drop off? Right in a row excellent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. True. Some good movies after, but never really remaking that success. But apparently Walt would also throw out sequences in some of the classic movies because he didn't think they worked very well. So maybe that's the secret, is you need to be able to kill your darlings. Right. When you have this much work and love and creativity that goes into a sequence of these films, you know, I was reading a quote by Michael Arndt, who wrote Toy Story 3. He was also the writer of Little Miss Sunshine. And he said that every Toy Story opens with a scene of the toys playing and an imagined imaginary world and in Toy Story 3 it's a train heist he said that it was rewritten Andy is playing with the toys excuse me well not in Toy Story 4 it's not Andy in 3 it is though and I think the other 2 it is what did I say you said the toys are playing okay I'm sorry Andy is playing I did push my glasses back that I'm not wearing (laughs) thank you for well actualing me that scene 
he said was written no fewer than 60 times. If I was working in this environment, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could put my heart and soul into something and be sent back 60 times to do it again, to make changes, to pick it apart. That may be and, why, and of course this also could be for the cameras they do this, but last year was a big part of this thing they would do back in the day. You'd see them making ofs. I've watched every scrap of making ofs on the Pixar films for the first maybe 10 years. I haven't done it so much lately. They have fun. I think the Hawaiian shirts thing, I know it was with Laster, a very big thing in their office. If you think that's fun, you think that's more casual. What is more casual? They work for Disney, for crying out loud. I'm sure most of them were wearing suits and ties and all the rest of this in Southern California. I must be proper at all times. But these guys are goofy and having fun. I've never heard about drug use and drinking, maybe. But at least in the sense of them going in there and just being themselves, they got to do that. So maybe it's easier to put up with somebody saying, that's not good enough, if the guy... Probably almost always a guy. Sometimes women, though. There's one woman. A woman on saved there. Toy Story too by having the files on her computer at home. Oh yeah, that's it got right. Erased. So oh, it's women God. do have important roles at this. Computer, okay, too. yes, they store the data. There I'm is just saying, a there woman times. who was on the main executive writing team for all three Toy Story movies. Right. I forget her name right now, but it's like six white guys <laughs> and one woman. But I'm just saying that maybe if it came from somebody who is not just telling you not good enough, do it again. We hear the way James Cameron works. I can see him saying to somebody, blank, 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 bad. But these guys probably said, you did a great job, but we have to restructure this. They might have been more political about it in a good way and made these people feel like, I accept the challenge. And maybe people approach that stuff differently when an environment is truly collaborative. And also, if we can quote John Hamm, that's what the money is for! for. (laughs) One more ad and another fun thing I discovered about Pixar, although fun for some, people would absolutely hate this. Everybody who works in the company has to do mandatory improv classes. Mm. Keep them feeling goofy. I think if you embarrass yourself that much in front of your coworkers, it probably makes it easier to brainstorm and be creative. And they have lots of all these rules that are really cool. I recommend looking them up. But one of them is once you write an idea down on paper, you can start fixing it. No matter how bad it is, you have to write it down. Because if you don't write it down, you'll never tell anybody and then it'll never become a good idea. There's lots more great little gems. Yeah, so Lasseter aside, some of the things that he did in this company, obviously, in a lot of ways, it was a great place to work. And look what they produced for a very long time. What happens next? Well, we know there's a sequel, of course, where Marlon and Nemo have to find Dory. But it seems pretty obvious what will happen next in this story if we exclude that for a minute. Nemo will get himself in trouble again, probably get cut and bleed into the water. The sharks will smell it, and he'll be swallowed. Then Marlin will be ruined forever, and he'll want shark vengeance. <laughs> Bruce, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Things over easy. <laughs> shark eggs over easy. <laughs> Around stick. <laughs> it's going to be like the John Wick of Pixar films. I killed the shark egg. I killed the shark egg. I killed the shark egg. Okay, then last thoughts on Finding Nemo, our first movie of May. Ignore everything I said at the beginning about what it is about it that I don't like because this is more or less a perfect film. It deserves all the praise that it got. It's something so truly special and it doesn't feel like it's aged a day. I still love it too. I don't know how many times I've seen it, but it's five, six, something like that. Okay, tomorrow I'll be posting a solo episode, just Ryan talking to himself in the podcast room. I'll be staying in and under the sea and doing a brief review of Moana, but also analyzing the career of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He happens to turn 51 tomorrow, so that's why I'm not waiting until Friday to get the show up. So no Friday show the 5th, just the 2nd of May. So sure, Moana's pretty good, but what's the point of this episode otherwise? Well, I've been hearing wrestling people say for many years that The Rock's the biggest star in the world. The biggest star in the world. The biggest star in the world. But is he? I'm going to explore the numbers to see if all the biggest star in the world talk is just wrestling people doing what they do, which is, to put it politely, stretch the truth, or if they're actually correct that their friend rules all. So it's basically a box office show where I'll be getting very deep into the weeds about how much cashola Mr. Johnson's movies have actually made. So I'll do five or ten minutes on Moana. I say that now, probably 15, which is probably the most respected movie he's been in so far, by the way. That's one reason I chose it. And I'm not a huge fan of a lot of stuff he's made, although I like him personally from what I've ever seen. And then we'll get into the numbers for most of that episode on May 2nd. In seven days, Bev and I will leave Australia's animated underwater world and head a little ways north to Japan as we cover our first ever Yasuhiro Ozu movie, the critically worshipped Tokyo Story. Toy Story, we just talked about that today. Now, <laughs> Tokyo Story. No connections otherwise. Well, actually, you know one connection? Rotten Tomatoes critics, both 100%. Huh. So the coming attractions trivia for Tokyo Story. Ozu is considered one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. He only lived to be 60 years old, though. As it relates to himself specifically, what was particularly noteworthy about the day he died? All right, so for the answer to that question, check out next week's podcast about Tokyo Story. 
You obviously already know how to find us, but let me remind you to favorite or subscribe wherever you listen. Like and share and all that stuff, too. Yes, tell your friends. And wherever you listen, you will have access to our archive of over 500 episodes that are available for free. We're both on Twitter. I'm at Bev Ellis Ellis, and Ryan is at MovieFiend51. You can also reach us by email, have you ever seen podcast at gmail.com. And don't forget that you can find our podcast plus bonus material on YouTube. Not so much lately with the bonus material. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've been slacking on the bonus material, but you can absolutely listen to our podcast on YouTube at H-Y-E-S Ellis. And to enjoy freshly roasted premium coffee delivered straight to you in Canada or the U.S., please go to sparkplug.coffee slash H-Y-E-S and enjoy a 20% discount. Righteous! Righteous! <laughs> He found him, by the way. He found him, Bev! <laughs> oh, thank God! <laughs> I knew? wasn't sure. And cut. Just keep cutting, just keep cutting, just keep cutting. Mine? Mine, 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 mine.